Um, of course, I'm very honored to be part of this wonderful exhibit. Um, actually, just to be sort of juxtaposed with these two towering figures of uh, hip hop literature is a bit overwhelming. I was trying to, to because writers really have to put things in words, I was trying to uh, express to myself what, you know, what the feeling was I felt, and all I could compare it to was what some young boys feel who, who uh, worship and try to imitate Major League Baseball players okay. when they're growing up. And then one day, one day, lo and behold, they find themselves in the show, uh, maybe even playing with or against some of those players that they idolized and were influenced by in their youth. It's in one way a dream come true, and in another way it's not quite real. Somehow, for me, The Outermost House has always been a very personal book, as I think it has been for a lot of its readers. I discovered it as a young man. It was given to me by a friend. I felt that somehow it was a personal discovery uh, to, to have that book. Um, I immediately loved the music in that book, the rhythms, the cadences, the sound, the onomatopoeia, uh, the images. Uh, the pure sensory, almost fleshly quality of Beston's prose. It's a book that begs to be read aloud. Um, and I was very pleased in 1990 when the Chatham Corral that uh, I've sung with, with for a number of years as, as Bud Ferris um, commissioned uh, its first work from Ron Carrera, and that was to make a setting of the outermost house for chorus. Um, and I worked with Ron. Uh, in his com not in the composing of it, but in choosing the passages uh, that eventually ended up in that uh, work. And it was a revelation to me because uh, he made me see Dustin's prose from a composer's point of view, from a musician's point of view, and made me see just how musical that prose is, which is one reason I think, it, unlike a lot of very good books, it lends itself very well to a musical setting. Uh, and that was a very satisfying experience. I've also always loved the intimacy of Vesta's voice, the sense that he's talking directly to you with great confidentiality and familiarity. I think you almost hear his voice as you read that book. And it encouraged me to get a personal tone in my own work. Uh, not a confessional tone, but a, but a, but a, a personal tone. Uh, and the difference is this. Um, think about how little you actually learn about Beston the man in reading his book, even though you get the sense of, of a great intimate relationship with him. You don't learn very much about him, where he came from, how he got the land on the beach, what his previous books were. Um, there's not much biographical information. But that voice of one human being speaking to another is so infused throughout that whole book, and that's what I have tried to do. Uh, to and finally, I think I was, I was influenced by that book's pervasive sense of, of ritual. Uh, you may remember a famous quote from the book is, life is commonly called a drama on a stage, but I think it is more justly referred to as a ritual. Uh, the notion of ritual pervades the outermost house. Uh, Bessner refers to the burning ritual of the sun, and in many ways it is a sun book. Um, there are large primal instances of this in the book. Uh, the battle he describes, the ongoing battle between the land and the sea, uh, the storms, uh, the shipwrecks, um, the stars at night, constellations. Uh, but that sense of ritual is also in the most homely and domestic activities that he describes in the book, when he lights his little kerosene lamp, when he imagines the millions of insect eggs that are buried in the sand. And, winter, um, his visits to the Coast Guardsmen from the station up, up the beach. He manages to put all these ordinary daily things in a, in a cosmic light. I think that's the magic of the book and what gives it a, a sense of sacrament. Um, and as much as I can, I think, I think that I can see attempts in my own work to do that kind of thing. Um, but finally, I think, as, as is true with all great books, it's impossible to say just where that greatness lies and how it touched you. You just know that it, it did and that in some way you were deeply influenced by it. it. 
it has been and remains one of the seminal books in my life uh, as both a reader and a writer, and I think it's incomparable. I don't think anyone will ever write a book uh, that matches the uttermost house in what it is. And I think unless we can find ways to make it practical and affordable for young writers and artists to live and work here, the Cape is in danger of losing its next generation of celebrants. And without celebrants like Henry Beston, John Hay, Betty Lane, David Gross, Harry Hall, Claire Layton, Mary Eaton Gorse, Mary Oliver, on and on. Without the gifted artists and writers to celebrate this land, its wild creatures, and its people, we're in danger of forgetting why we need this place. If I were going to claim the title of visionary at all, it would be in the hopes of fostering a vision where this exhibit that you're about to see represents an ongoing tradition and not the end of one. A vision that recognizes the need to provide conditions that nurture and foster not only the local environment, but those who teach us to see and love it. And now, please go out and be inspired by this wonderful exhibit. Thank you.